Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation, date September 10th, 1997, Survivor Barry Gurari, Interviewer Dina Cohen, City Montclair, New Jersey, Country USA, Language English. My name is Dina Cohen. Today is September 10th, 1997. I will be conducting an interview with Barry Gurari in Montclair, New Jersey, USA. The interview will be in English. Could you state your name and spell it, please? My name is Barry, that's B as in boy, A-R-R-Y, Shalom, I usually use the middle initial, S as in Sam, H-O-L-O-M, and the last name is Gurari, G as in George, O-U-R-A-R-Y. And your name at birth, what was that? Shalom Ber Gurari, same spelling except that the middle name, in this case, the sequence of names was changed. Shalom comes first, Ber second, and then comes Gurari. Were you known by any other names? At one time in my life, when I was a Latvian citizen, my legal name was Shalom's Bers Guraris. Did you want to spell that too? No. <laughs> no. And when were you born? On February the 10th, 1923. And the city and country of your birth? I was born in Rostov on the Don in Russia. At that time it was the Soviet Union. And did you grow up in Rostov on Don? No, we left Rostov when I was about three months old. And who is we? We being uh, my parents, my grandparents, and I don't know who else. <laughs> At the age of three, uh, four months, I did not keep a very adequate inventory yet. Could you describe your parents? Yes. Uh, I should really start with my grandparents, if you don't mind. Okay. My, grandparent, my grandparents were uh, the Grand Rabbi, or in Hebrew, Admur, Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson. May you, a blessed memory. He was at the time the Rebbe of Lubavitch. He was a, a descendant of a long, long generation dating back to the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Schneir Zalman, as was known as Rabbi Schneir Zalman Borochovich. And uh, my grandmother was uh, Nechama Dina Schneerson, of a different line of Schneersons, but still with the same name. Now, these were my maternal grandmother, grandparents. My mother was Hannah Schneerson, the eldest of three daughters of my grandparents. The other two were Musia and Sonia. And my father was uh, Sam Samarius Gurari, in Hebrew, Shmariohu Gurari a member of the well-known, at the time, Gurari clan from Kleminchuk. What is the origin of the Gurari name? I am told that the Gurari name dates back to, what is it, the 16th century. And it has an <laughs> interesting history. At the time, there was a very well-known rabbi in Prague. Czechoslovakia. Uh, his name was uh, Rabbi Levi. Um, he had written a number of important treatises. One of them was a commentary on the Bible. And as was customary in those days, he took a passage from the Bible to, title, to serve as t 
title of his work. The passage he chose was Gur Arye. Gur Arye means alliance whelp or alliance cub. It comes from the passage in the Bible which says, alliance cub is Judah. So since he wrote his book and he titled it that way, later his children and grandchildren took the name Gurarie as their last name. That's the story. <laughs> and what was your father like? My father was a very energetic doer. Uh, he also liked to study. The subject he liked to study particularly was Hasidus. This, this is a branch of, uh, it's a mixture in a sense of Kabbalah and uh, mysticism. And uh, he was in particularly, particularly interested in the kind of Hasidus that uh, was preached by my grandfather and by the, uh, his predecessors in the Lubavitcher chain. But otherwise, father was a very energetic man. He spent many years first at the yeshiva, the yeshiva in Lubavitch, in fact. And interestingly enough, he had a roommate. His roommate's name was Beryl Haskind. It so happens that I married Beryl Haskind's daughter a little later on. <laughs> And your mother, what was she like? My mother was a very caring, loving person. Very lovable, very loving, very lovable, but extremely strong-willed. And in many ways, she set the family agenda. In the years which I remember, which was particular, which I remember already on my own without being told so much about it. I remember that starting in 1930, when my grandfather became seriously ill, he had multiple sclerosis. She set the family agenda at making it possible for grandfather to continue to his work as, a, as the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He needed a great deal of help. And to a large extent, of course, to a large extent, thanks to his own iron will and to the help of many friends, but also to a very substantial extent, thanks to my mother and her complete dedication to helping him uh, continue. And with some help from me, he was able to carry on until his death in 1950. You said that you didn't grow up in Rostov-on-Don. Where no. did you move to after that? I don't remember the exact sequence. As I said, I didn't start keeping notes until after we left Russia. We left Russia when I was four. But uh, we moved to Moscow. We moved to Leningrad. Since my grandfather was uh, very active at the time, in organizing Jewish schools and in making sure that there was an opportunity for Jewish children to study uh, the traditional Hebrew texts and to study them in a way uh, that was appropriate and to teach Hasidus to them, he was found to be a, against the regime. He was openly so. He was at one point arrested, condemned to death for his counter-revolutionary activities. Remember, those were the years of the, uh, of the very violent kind of Bolshevism in Russia. And uh, he, later on, under severe pressure from the United States, and uh, thanks, by the way, to people like to his followers in the United States, people like Rabbi Israel Jacobson, my 
late father and about Beryl Haskin, the Kramer brothers, particularly Sam Kramer, who was a very prominent lawyer, Sam, Sam Kramer's uh, partner, who was New York State Senator Kleinfeld, and a number of other people, uh, many of whom I just can't remember. Uh, he was finally released from, he was finally uh, forgiven, I shouldn't say forgiven, his, uh, his sentence was commuted to uh, three years or more in jail, and then in Kastrama, which was a very undesirable area in Russia. With a little more pressure, he was finally expelled from the Soviet Union, and with him went the whole family. Now, again, I should mention one person whom I did not yet mention, who was very active in that, and that was Mordechai Dubin, who was a deputat, that, me that meant a representative in the Latvian Sejm. Sejm was the legislature. And who did everything that could possibly be done to help my grandfather get out of Russia, and then provide him with a stable, uh, stable place to live in Latvia. Thanks to Dubin, in fact, my grandfather, his family, his immediate his spouse, and the other members of his family, like ourselves, were given Latvian citizenship. And we found a home. What was your home like in Latvia? Well, it was a peaceful oasis. It was very peaceful. I probably, I don't have very many uh, memories of that. Uh, let's face it, uh, I left uh, Russia when I was four. Uh, we left Riga when I was probably about nine. So, again, I don't have too many Riga collections, except for a very peaceful and pleasant environment, and pleasant times at the beach, for example, at Bouldery. And uh, there is other such insignificant, but yet very, very important parts of daily life. Did your grandfather have a following in Latvia? Yes, my grandfather had a substantial following in Latvia, uh, starting with Mordechai Dubin himself, who was a very important man. By the way, I should say about one other thing about Dubin. He was a very close friend and confidant of the then strongman of Latvia. The strongman was Karlis Umanis. And that had a lot to do with his power and his influence. He was extremely important in the, to, for the Jewish community in that he provided the Jewish community in Latvia with a firm and stable base, not typical in many other European countries. And did you go to school in Latvia? I'm sorry, I, I should fill in a few more names mm. in Latvia, names like Judovich, Mordechai Feifetz, many others. Unfortunately, my memory is not very good, so I cannot spell them out, but there were many, many of them. Uh, interestingly enough, though, if I may say that, in those days, the number of followers was still relatively small as compared to what it is now, because of the fact that the means of communication were so different. It was before telephones were available. It was before typewriters were readily available. Uh, written words had to be written. If you wanted multiple copies, there was no Xerox. There were people who would copy these, like scribes. And uh, that, in turn, limited the number. And yet, it provided also another aspect to it. Because of the fact that there were fewer people, they were closer. 
we could tell, we could remember individuals who were members of my grandfather's uh, following. We knew their parents, we knew of their grandparents, sometimes several generations. We knew their children. It was more built on a family structure than it is, than is typical nowadays of a movement. You said you left Latvia when you were nine? Approximately. I, my memory is not that good. And that goes, by the way, that comment goes for everything I say in this interview. Dates may be off a little. But we, there were two important events that took place while we were in, uh, partly in Latvia, and yet the events themselves took place in Poland. First, the marriage of my <coughs> uncle Mendel to Mendel Schneerson. Schneerson in his own right, not <laughs> my grandfather's. Uh, and my uh, aunt Musia. Musia was my mother's young middle sister. Mother was the oldest. Musia was the second. And that took place probably about 1928. It took place in Poland. If I remember correctly, that one was in Warsaw. And then there was another, uh, another important moment, and that was the wedding of my younger aunt, which took place later. And it took place again in Poland, this time, if I remember correctly, in Druskini. And Sonia married a young man by the name of Menachem Mendel Hornstein, who was related to the Schneerson family. He was a very, very distant cousin. <coughs> now, in the meantime, grandfather was working very hard trying to save the religious Jewry of Russia. And he did that both by uh, trying to get others to do it, by doing it himself, by having his immediate entourage do that. But one of the important initiatives he undertook was to go to America in order to build a following here and in order to get those people to work for the release of many of the uh, Orthodox Jewish dissidents who were being jailed in Russia, and in order to make it possible for some of them to get out of Russia with their families. That was a trip that he undertook in 1929 and 1930. It was most, it was most of a year partly 29, partly 30. Uh, my father went with him on that uh, trip. My grandfather also wanted his other, his elder, his middle uh, son-in-law, Mendel Schneerson, to come with him. But Mendel Schneerson and his wife, Musia, chose uh, the, uh, to pursue their own ends, which at that point involved going to Berlin, Germany, and studying at the University at Berlin. <coughs> and my uncle was studying uh, natural philosophy, the name at that time given to the science of physics, and mathematics. From my observations of his actions in later life, I found that while he hadn't, he hadn't learned much natural philosophy and mathematics, he learned an enormous amount about methods of organization from the movements that were at that time active in Germany, namely from the Nazi movement. And he also learned the value of propaganda from them. He employed it to his own ends later on. So this was a very important period for him until the time came when <coughs> the Nazi climate became such that he had to escape from Russia. That was circa 1932, probably. 
during the time of between 1929 and 1930, when we, when my grandfather and my father were in America, <coughs> my mother and I went for a visit to Musa and Mendel in Berlin. And so that was another departure from Latvia, where our official residence was still Latvia. And that was a very interesting kind of period. On the one hand, I enjoyed it. My uncle was very, very, my uncle and I were very friendly at the time. Uh, he did all kinds of things for me, like take me to the zoo. And you will see a picture <laughs> resulting from that. A picture in the zoo where I have a sit with two little lion cubs, one of them sitting on my lap, the other one lying at my feet, <laughs> taking a picture. I'm not quite sure who was more worried, the cubs or I. They had more experience than I did, <laughs> because this was an opportunity afforded to many visitors. At that time, I also visited, I also, if I may, I also <coughs> visited, uh, well, of course, we saw Mendel and Musi a great deal. And one of the things I used to, I remember from that time was games. Now, these were games that were being played by my uncle and his brother. His brother was a very peculiar duck, very capable man. His name was Lova, which is uh, Russian for label, or for the Hebrew would be Yehuda Leib. <coughs> and Label was a, an atheist. He also was a counter-revolutionary. So he managed to be hated by two groups, not one. <laughs> anyway, he made his life out of Russia, his, his way, I should say, out of Russia, and came to Berlin. In Berlin, he and my uncle used to play games. Now, when I would visit, I would often climb up onto the top of, their, of a large wardrobe in their living room. It was a living room, bedroom combination. In Europe, there wasn't that much space. And their game consisted of pulling two beds together and then trying to jump over that. I've seen many more successful, very few uh, successful jumps than I have seen spills. <laughs> but it was very interesting to watch for a kid of my age at the time. In any case, uh, there are other memories of uh, Berlin. What was your impression of Berlin? As a, as a young boy? In those days, it was a very interesting city. But again, I don't have such detailed recollections. Remember again, this was a trip when I was about seven. You, you, don't, uh, you don't have that many memories. I have one memory, I should say, which I did not describe from Russia, if I may at this stage. In fact, it's my only good memory of that. And that was a memory of visiting my grandfather in jail. That was at the time when we were by no means sure that he was going to come out of it alive. I remember going there with my grandmother, my great-grandmother, and my mother. Women were safer, see, in those days. That's why my father was already in trouble. He was in jail, too. But I remember visiting my grandfather. I remember the appearance of the jail, I think I remember it. A large hall with something like a row of cells along one side. And it's almost like a corridor with windows which were barred, small grates on the windows. Occasionally a grate would be opened and someone would come out and he would jump out through the window and just talk to his visitors. Grandfather wasn't permitted to do that. I asked why. Well, only those who are not condemned to death are permitted to do that. The Galovniki, it means those who are expected to be killed, are not permitted out. And I remember the waiting room of that particular jail, he said, there was a large hole in the wall. I never understood what it was for. 
Although now I suspect it was probably for somebody to sit behind it and listen. Since in those days, a recording apparatus was not so readily available. But I'm sorry, this was a throwback to an earlier era. Getting back to 1929, 1930. Yes. Um, how successful was your father and grandfather's trip to the United States? Unfortunately, successful only in the sense of inspiring my grandfather's followers and a few others. But uh, 1929 and 1930 were the times when the Depression struck. And so it was extremely difficult to get any large-scale financial help. People were concerned about other things, not about other people's welfare, but about their own. And it was a very difficult time. So successful in some ways, but a failure in financial matters. Still, ever since then, and even before then, Thanks again to the people I had already mentioned. The United States has always helped my grandfather and many of his followers escape the very worst of consequences. What do you recall about their return to Riga? I don't. I'm sorry. Okay. I have no memories <laughs> of that. I do know that my grandfather's illness dates back to that time. Apparently, during his period in the United States, he fasted a great deal. And that apparently had something to do with it, although I am not sure that it had anything directly to do. The disease is not traceable to any very specific uh, origin. And when did you leave Latvia? Probably sometime around 1932 or 33. I'm not sure. And then we moved to Warsaw, to Warsaw at first. Do you remember why you left? Yes, the reason was primarily that my grandfather felt that he wanted to have a broader field of activity. Spread wor God's word many more people. In Latvia that wasn't possible. So he moved to Warsaw. Uh, life changed. The movement g gradually. The movement grew larger. The family aspect of the movement became weaker. We'll discuss yes. more on the next tape. Okay.